very much, Rabbi Feinberg. Thank you for reminding me of my trip to Rochester. I actually made two trips to Rochester, one for that purpose. And I don't remember which one this was, but we were having a cold snap in the Northeast. Now, for those of you from home, you don't know that, but the weather does go down below 80 degrees sometimes in the, the, the Northeast. And it was mine, it was like 16 degrees in New York City, and it was six degrees in Rochester. And uh, oh, that's right. I think I was speaking in what are they called? St. Peter's, right? St. Regis. Uh, Regis. St. Regis. Okay. And I thank them for getting me out of the cold weather of New York City. You know, but, but now I can really say, but uh, okay. Anyway, uh, first of all, let me start. Uh, you know, the rabbi of my community where I grew up used to begin his sermon with before I speak, I want to say something. So before I speak, I want to say something. First of all, on behalf of uh, Ohel, uh, David Mandel, our CEO, Jay Kessler, and Mel Zafter, our, our city, I want to extend the condolences to all of you for the, for the loss and the losses you've had actually uh, uh, in these past few weeks. And uh, as always, as the, as the Rav said, it will be Hashem who will give you Nechama. I will give you knowledge, but Nechama will come from Hashem. Um, there was one mistake Rabbi Feinberg made in the introduction. He said it's Oral Children's Home and Family Services from New York. As of last Monday, <laughs> we have an Oral Children's Home and Family Services in South Florida. Um, we we have a, we're, we're doing, you know, again, we're not stepping on toes. We're not trying to take away from anything that's done. And I know what a rich community this is and how much it's done, but we we have a we got a grant to go national. And we basically have two part of a two-pronged uh, program bringing here. We're not bringing foster care. We're not bringing the housing and all the other things that are with us. But we are bringing a trauma team that we're training. And we have uh, Rafa who is one of your local uh, Boca people, who's going to be directing that part of the program, who's here. And just be aware of her. And then we're also doing something very exciting. Um, and I'm just talking about it very briefly. I'm going to get to our subject, which is we're doing uh, resilience. We're bringing resilience to schools. We're doing trauma sensitivity in schools. There's a shift taking place in mental health now. Um, it used to be that the pattern was, let's say, in a school, uh, teacher taught information and then identified those handful of students who had emotional problems and would send them to the school social worker, the school psychologist. The problems that are existing today, both in terms of trauma, anxiety, et cetera, are so huge. Um, I, saw, I, mean, I, I saw my old friend, Marofa Kalgan, this one thing we opened up. He doesn't know what to do with the amount of you know, issues that he has in the school. Um, so, so we're what it's what, and what we're doing is instead of this pattern of identifying and the, the psychologists, we're bringing psychology, we're bringing mental health services into the school. We're training teachers, we're deputizing teachers to recognize anxiety, trauma, depression, and to address it or to build up resilience, to build up coping mechanisms. We had in New York, we have a MAP program in 10 schools, which has a middle, um, a middle school anxiety prevention program where we've done just this and it's they're thriving and we're piloting this program here in South Florida where we're going to bring mental health services into the school instead of taking out the student. And that will be directed by Mental Forum, who couldn't make it tonight because he had other applications, but just want to make you aware of that. So we're here, and that's why I have to be here uh, for this new initiative. Um, I'm going to try to orient you, as I said, I, I can't give the Nechama, only Hashem can give Nechama, but I'm going to try to orient you to grief. I'm going to try to familiarize you with what grief is, what works, how to help, and really with an eye towards helping the family and, and helping our children. I think it's very representative. I did not know Donnie Lindenberg before I came down here. I, didn't, I mean, until I heard about this. I did not know him. I've, in varying ways, been addressing the, what his death, and I know him. I know him. I know his family. I wouldn't recognize them, but they have become a family, and he has become a person that I'm increasingly getting to know. And I think that's very representative of what one asked, one very important aspect of grief, because the challenge in grieving is to take the person who, with whom you had a face-to-face -face relationship and make the person a living memory. And that's, you're doing it very well. Because as I said, not having met him while he was alive, I know him and I know his family. And that's part of grieving. 
I often tell people that when someone dies, a relationship doesn't end. It changes. It changes from a face-to-face -face relationship to a relationship of memories, a relationship of legacies, which is why, although I will not need my endorsement, that's why Shiva is so brilliant. Because if you do Shiva right, and not everybody does, you are, uh, you're, 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 having, you're, you're doing that. You're creating that process where the person is, becomes a living memory. In fact, someone once, I once heard during a hesped for a child, um, uh, the Rav said, we have a tradition during Shiva to cover the merits. And the question is, why, why cover that? So one reason is obviously you shouldn't be adorning yourself. But he said something else that was so brilliant. He said, a mirror shows a reflection of someone who's here. The challenge of, uh, in grief is to see someone who's not here. And that's what we do. And that's the transition that the family is going through now and that you are going through and helping, helping them go through. And by the way, let me mention a few things about that, which is very important. That's why it's so important during Shiva to share information, let the, the family talk about the, about the Nifter, to share what you know. But I want to tell you something that I do in school sometimes. Again, lower lane, a child dies, a, a fourth grader dies. You know, I, just, I always say this, this is my standard line. I always say this so I don't get invited to parties because people ask me what I do for a living and when the party's over, you know, it's like, I have all these stories, but um, a fourth grade let's say dies, right? And I'm meeting with the kids and I'm talking to them and I'm telling them about Shiva. And I say something very important to them and please, I, don't, I have no propriety of it. Everything I say, do it, use it, please. But I say to them something very nice. I say, you know, the parents know what Moishi is like uh, at the Shabbos table. They know what Moshe is like on family vacations. They know what Moshe is like, uh, you know, uh, during, uh, you know, midwinter break. They don't know what Moshe is like on the ball field. They don't know what he's like during recess. You do. Share that with the parents because that's Shiva. That's how it becomes a living memory. But then, no, and it's, it's a wonderful thing to do because you're empowering the children. They don't know what to do. They come to Shiva. They're scared out of their minds. So you have a unique function. You have a unique connection. I don't know how many of you remember I'm at that age where I sometimes have to think, well, thank God my cold beer. Come, but, you know, I don't know, but how many of you remember the Sparrows bombing, the pizza bombing in Israel? One of the victims, Ronald Bracha, was Shana Heyman. Shana Heyman, Grew up in California, was uh, uh, Dr. Mrs. Heyman's only child. She was expecting her first child. Uh, the Heymans couldn't even make it in time to Levi and Eretz Israel because they were coming from, from LA. Um, but I was in touch with them. And on their way for their first visit to Israel, after the Kira, they asked me, she was a teacher, a very beloved teacher in our neighborhood. Both my daughters had her as a teacher. They, they asked me if they could stop by my house and speak to my daughters because that part of her life, they were fairly disconnected. They wanted to know, they wanted to connect, they wanted to relate to it. And my daughters agreed and each one had her in seventh grade, one had her in fourth grade. And in fact, I remember my older daughter brought her Lama Tess Malachas book that she had done with her and gave it to them. But that's, that's how you make someone a living memory. And that's a very, and that doesn't, it's not just Shiva. It's so important make sure for yourselves and for the family that Danny Lindbergh is not forgotten, that he's remembered. And it doesn't have to be anything profound. Um, I, I, one family I remember, I remember working who lost a son, and they spent every Hanukkah with their friends, certain friends. And one Hanukkah that is about three years after their son died, and the woman's making latkes, and she just turned to them and said, I remember how much Josh loved my latkes. And I was so touched. They remember Josh and they remember that he loved her latkes. That alone was a tremendous nahama. And that's what you can do for the women first. That's what they're going to do for themselves. And by the way, I have one soapbox that I really I just feel very strongly about it. So you'll excuse me if it's a little bit of a tangent. But when you go pay a shiva visit, it's really not important to talk about how the person died. It's more important to talk about how the person lived. I don't get it. You know, the guy was 95. He spent 94 years and 50 weeks living and two weeks dying. And all people want to talk about is how he died. It's not important. It's important. It's important how he lived. In fact, I want to tell you something very interesting. Sometimes people ask me, how do you know you did Nishim Avel? How do 
you know, if you if you visit someone with the Michelin Pass, I give them a you know, the yes test. If when you leave the the base level, when you leave the house, if you know more about the person who died than when you came in, you did Michelin Pass. You didn't say a thing. I, I you know about two years ago, Marshall Weinberger's father died. I know him from the neighborhood. But we have a connection, but I'm not like I'm not one of his blah 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 them. You know, I was one of his them, so I figured, okay, last day I'll go visit. Of course, I come in, the place is packed. There wasn't even a seat, so I was standing. And I listened, and he told him two stories about his father. I walked over, I said, I'm up, and I left. I didn't need my bed. Now, this, I know his father, not a whole lot. I know some, his father's remembered. His father's the living memory, and that's very important. And that can be part of how you can help the family. And not so much now. Now it's front and center on the mind. In fact, there's something I hear, and I just heard it today from someone. Something I hear very often from people who are just before I left, even. Um, a, a woman called me who's, who's um, unfortunately overdosed. And it's, she's entering the third year of bailship. This is the hardest year. Because at first, year everybody was talking about, everyone's remembering it now. Everyone's going on with their lives. And nobody's thinking about it. He's front and center in my mind. I feel so alone. So right now, this loss, this void that you feel in the community is, 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 uh, is very present, very powerful. So you're all talking about it. But two years, three years, five years, 10 years from now, remember him. And, and that is such a source of Nechama and, and very important. Um, as I said, I got to know. I know Danny is such an, uh, was such an active member. I know that he was God by. I know that he's the family that doers, that they're, that they're builders. Yes, I got, I, I have a sense. I have a, a sense of who he is. And that's what you need to continue to do. And that's part of, whether it's him or anybody else, that's part of the Nechama process to make sure this person is not forgotten. Those, that's very important. And this accounts for probably the most, the most common, well-meaning, but if you will, hurtful remarks people make. It's human nature that you see someone in pain, you want to make them feel better. You're walking out of shul and a kid just fell down and he's crying, he scraped his knee. What do you want to do? You scoop him up, you give, you know, you give him a lollipop, you know, you take him to his father so he can then hear it, and then he kisses the boo-boo. We want to make people feel better when they're in pain. And that's a natural inclination that we want to do for our baby. We want to make them feel better. But what most people don't realize that in grief, the pain is not only normal, but necessary. It's essential. I sometimes, the way I present it, I know when I teach, I teach in the Hawaii Sneha program, I I teach. And when I'm teaching about bereavement, I, I, I give them a, a shy a, a question. I tell them we have a condition called depression. Depression is characterized by sadness, psychic pain. We have another condition that's, that's called grief, which looks like depression. And early theoreticians saw them really as the same. We have a technique called psychotherapy. Psychotherapy um, is we have about an 80% cure rate with depression. And yet the research shows that psychotherapy for grief is at best harmless and may actually be harmful. So we get the thumbs up to hear you have two conditions. So similar, one psychotherapy is helpful and the other psychotherapy isn't. Why, why not be? And I think most of you can probably figure it out. Certainly the Lindbergh's don't have it. In depression, there's a disconnect between your emotions and the reality of your life. You have a normal life, and yet you feel disproportionately sad. In grief, the sadness is not only legitimate, but necessary. So the question is why. And by the way, so just like clarify that, I was saying before, many of the, everybody who said Shiva has probably a litany of well-meaning, but inappropriate things that people say. Uh, I know one, parent who lost a child tells me that when someone comes to me and says, your son's in a better place, and I'm like, your son in a better place. But my favorite actually is my aunt, way older, but she was you know, still fine and everything. And when my uncle died, she was sitting shiva, and one woman came over to before they were leaving and said, don't worry, you'll be seeing him soon. She said, I feel fine. You know, like, they wanted to make them feel better, but it's not what they need. They need validation of their pain. They need to be legitimized. And I will tell you that I have a very dear close friend and colleague, his 19-year-old son in Montreal, 19-year-old son, collapsed after a hockey game died. And I remember that they found in his Gemara, in other words, uh, posted 
that said playing hockey tonight make up an hour of learning. That's the kind of boy he is. And uh, I went up to Montreal to visit him. And I sat there. And he talked. I didn't say a word. I got up. I said, can I give you a hug? He said, yeah, we had a delicious hug. We cried together. I said, I'm not going to laugh. I flew from New York to Montreal for a hug and a cry. That's the available. That's 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 what that's what's comforting. And many people have described similar. I don't know one person who lost a child told me that his Kabrusa traveled from Baltimore to New York to pay a ship visit. He walked in, he sat down, he cried for 10 minutes straight, he got up, he said, I'm not and he drive back to Boston. He said he drove eight hours for a 10-minute cry. And he said that was the most comforting visit. Allow them their pain. Don't deprive them. The pain is necessary. Now the question may ask, why? And by the way, but, um, you know, if you, if you want, uh, uh, again, this is a yeshiva. So let me cite some sources. But, but I always warn people, <coughs> don't be impressed with my alumnus. It's limited to trauma and bereavement. Otherwise, I'm a registered bona fide amaharas. You know, so please don't be impressed. But um, there's, uh, you know, perhaps one of the most two most powerful words in the Mount Bal Karaj. So the two most powerful words is when Aaron's children die. Moshe comes over and gives the Chama, and then says, "Vayidom Aaron." Aaron was silent. So the question is asked, and it's a Sefer Kabbalah, I believe, in the Rabbanel asked, "Why the word Vayidom?" The typical word for silence is Shtika. So they're going to explain that Shtika is when you have something to say. But you don't say, it, which is a my one. There's a rather my community likes to say that a fish never gets caught if it cuts its mouth shut. You know, it's it's in my life. By Edom, Aaron is that deep abiding silence when there's nothing to say. And if you come and pay a shoe visit, especially in situations like this, and you silently sit with the person, that's Nikhma Bail, you're validating their pain. Don't tell them they're gonna get over it, and nobody does ever get over it. Uh, don't tell him that he's in a better place. Don't tell him about guilt on the fascists. Sharing the pain, the pain is essential. And the question is why? Why did Hashem make us in such a way that we should be in pain? Hashem could have created us that we take it in stride. What's the function of the pain? So I'll explain to you as I usually do. Um, us as mental health professionals often deal with two types of problems. There are problems we can solve. Like depression, we have therapy, we can solve that problem. Someone needs money, they ran out of money. I can give them money. There's some problems we can't solve. Child born with birth defects. I, I, um, someone has a fall and is paralyzed. So we can't fix it. Or death, we can't reverse. What can we do for those people? What can we do? And the answer is we can't fix the problem. So the person has to become someone who can bear that problem. The person has to become, if you will, stronger. So they can bear that, what's missing in their lives. So grief, a veilus, is a growing experience. It's becoming someone who can sustain and bear the loss. And we grow through pain. That's human nature. Haraya, the one day in our calendar, most associated with change and growth, Yom Kippur, is Inui Nefesh. We, we put ourselves through pain. And that's that's and that's the function of pain. That's why Shem made us to be suffering of pain during, during grief. But the worst thing to do is try to help them get rid of their pain. And by the way, one more thing. Never ever, and this goes for people who are mourning, people who are sick, or whatever they're dealing with, never pity. Never, no puppy of this. Because pity means, oh, I'm up here, you're down here, you poor thing. You give over the chama with dignity. I have a, a very close friend and colleague. And the book, his wife was, was, was uh, I should know this going might be my friend. You know, so, okay. um, you know, his wife was killed in a pedestrian accident on uh, Friday for coming from Black Flowers to the family. And he said, during the Shiva, several people came to him and said, Hashem should give you strength. He didn't like that. He said, one person came over to him and said, Hashem will give you strength. That he liked. That's the difference, the subtle difference. But the subtle, sometimes subtleties are really are huge. One is you poor thing. 
what is it? You're going to be all right. You're going to be okay. Like Hashem will take care of you. Um, and that's the world of difference. So when we, you know, when you're helping, when you're extending your feeling of condolences, when you're talking to the family, talking to the children, do so with shtos, do so like with confidence. They're going to be again, and everything I hear about both uh, the, you know, the Mrs. Lindenberg and the children, I feel very confident that they're going to be okay. There's a, a line I use, and again, I, 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 it's not mine, I'm giving it over. I sometimes tell people, there's a difference between them being affected and damaged. There's no question that children are permanently affected by the loss of their father being damaged. That doesn't mean they're going to be damaged. I want to share with you a very interesting thing that happened to me about a year ago. I'm at an organization, and I'm a sort of a psychologist in the organization, and we have a lay board of wealthy people who raise the money and make sure the finances are okay. And we we're going to hire someone for this visit for the, for the organization. So me and a, a friend of mine, who's a very wealthy man, has a very successful life, wealthy family, make a good do from everything, you know, every point. And um, he was interviewing with me. So he was representing the white board. I, I was uh, the professional. In the middle of the interview, he turns to the guy and he said, he was apparently a young age. Yeah, my father died when I was 11. My wife says, Yeah, well, my father died when I was nine. I'm the psychologist, I'm the bereavement specialist. I had no idea. And afterwards, I said to my she said, Which, how do you know? I want to know that. Because I can't tell I just feel it. I can sense it. And I just knew the other was apparently a That's effective, not that. Very successful man. Very not a compliment. That's the same thing. Yeah. And, and that's the thing, and that's the message also you have to give to the family. They're gonna, it's it's terribly painful. It'll always be there. Every chasna, every grandchild that's born, that thing is gonna affect. There's a line I hear sometimes people I work with because I can feel their absence is having to leave their absence is everything. So I can feel their absence is everything. They're gonna feel his absence. They're gonna feel that void. But they're gonna function and be successful. They're going to go on with life, and you we give that over in that fashion. And let me just conclude by explaining. So then, what is the hum? Is is if if pain is essential, what what is the hum? Just very quickly, I'll share with you what I have a personal insight. When I was starting to do this work, and I was getting a hang of it, it's been five ten years to get. I'm now going to be about ninety eight years, but um, I'll do it about five. Yes. And there was a, uh, unfortunately, a tragedy in Philadelphia. A young man was leaving shoe on circus, was hit by a car, and the full view of his family and the kids who had this camp counselor. And, uh, and so there was trauma and bereavement and everything else down there in Philadelphia. And uh, I was interviewed by some radio person, and he's asking about the trauma for the kids. And then at one point he says to me, What about? The parents of this young man that they never get old. And a word can be said, this came out of my mouth and was established by a friend. I said, I said, we will be forever, but the pain is. Understand the fun, and the fun is not that you stop grieving. The Danny will be grieved by all of you, by his wife, or by his children, until the Shia comes. Until the reunite. But but what happens is because you go through that transformation, because you go through that growth through the pain, it doesn't hurt as much. So that's just explained this way. But the main message to you is please don't try to talk around your parents. Don't try to put the end on the other hand, don't drown them also with pity. Sometimes what I hear from people is, you know, the first Two, three months, everybody's coming over, everybody's hugging and kissing you, sending them food and all that. And then here, everybody begins. Do less, do it right. And mostly give over the Nafama with confidence and according to them the way and manner, how you look at them, how you say the tone of your voice. It's a very interesting thing I've learned so over the years and learned it the hard way that when someone's in pain, when someone has suffered a loss of whatever, Especially with children, by the way, your body language and your voice tone is sometimes more important than what you say. 
I have to go into a school and there's been a terrible tragedy, a scary event that occurred. I act very confident. When I get out, like I got the car, I fall apart. But I talk, my, my posture, my voice tone, I act more sure of myself than I really am. Yeah, yogurt is good. Kids are scared out of their mind. And, I, and we bring in this outside expert, there's a quiver in his voice. But if he's not sure of himself, they're going to be more scared. So it's, but it's so your voice tone is very, very important. Let me talk a little bit about, and uh, we have a small group so we can have some, some of the and questions. If I'm going to maybe even through Zoom, it's possible. Uh, I can help Zoom go out. Okay, but um, let me let me talk a little bit about children because <laughs> the children and the children in the family, the children have been exposed as classmates. That under, the child's understanding and processing of death depends on their age. Children's brains are developing. And like with everything else, their capacity to intend or the manner or fashion in which they will process tragedy will depend very much on their age. I, I don't have time to go through every single detail developmentally. It's it's a you know three-hour lecture, but I'm gonna highlight some of the key points. First of all, children under six. Don't get that. They don't understand that. They know it exists, but they, they don't understand the permanence. They don't understand the deterioration of the body. For them, you know, adults are disappearing accident. You know, mom and dad go on vacation, leaving with grandma and grandpa. You know, uh, mom and dad go on a business trip and, uh, you know, come back later. So, this is another one of these interesting disappearing acts where the person leaves, but they, they often don't grieve. They're often not sad. They just don't get it. That's not because they're cowards. The brain isn't developing. And I'll give you two of my favorite examples. One is one child who, about three months after his father died, a four year old went to his mother and said, Well, what's stopping us stop dying? You know, just don't get my, one of my favorite. It was actually not something I heard this from a colleague of mine who told me that when the daughter was three years old, <coughs> her grandmother died. That was the, the three year old's great grandmother. So they went to the mother, grandmother's house during the Shiva. So the three-year-old said, where's Bobby uh, Sarah? So, you know, the, the great grandma. So they said, that she died. So she said, so plug her in and recharge her. That's 2022, but three-year-olds understand about that. They don't, they don't really get it. Now, sometimes they suddenly, if they do realize a common thing, and this is a very common question that I get asked is, you know, so uh, Dr. Lindenberg died. And so now your, your four or five year old comes to your father, comes to your mother, comes to mother and says, well, are you going to die like Dr. Lindenberg? So of course the answer is, well, it's highly unlikely. I'm very healthy. I go to the doctor. It's highly unlikely. That's a fine answer for a six and older. Five year olds don't understand the concept of prayer. Their whole world was three blocks long. So, you know, they say it's highly unlikely. That means it's going to happen. You're going to scare them. So usually what I suggest, I get in trouble for this, but I won't die. I see you say to them, no, I'm not going to die. Now, I, how do you know? Five-year-olds aren't interested in facts. They want to feel safe. And the odds are in your favor, Baruch Hashem, we've lived in very healthy times, we've good times. It's interesting. We had a problem with this during the height of COVID. That was a whole different challenge because there was so, so much death. We couldn't really do this. Couldn't even say it was rare. So we had to alter it. If you're interested, I'll explain what we did. But, but on six and older, you can talk about it being rare. Uh, but five, under the five, you can't. And if, again, if you're concerned, if your child is scared, by the way, sometimes I get a call from a parent, doesn't this happen? I, I don't know how my four year old, five year old is handling it. You know what I tell them sometimes? Does, does he or she engage in imaginary play? Most of that age do. Listen to the play. Because if they're struggling with it, we'll be in their play. Um, and uh, you know, usually when they're playing, we're happy to get rid of them. But, if you're not ever concerned about a child that age, listen to their play. Very quickly, uh, elementary school age children understand death. They understand rare. One hallmark of the elementary school age child, and I know there's a fifth grader here, is they don't want to be different. They don't want to stick out. The classic elementary school age child wants to be more of an else. He wants to be part of the whole group. So, you know, so they're not going to, and, and they don't want a lot of fanfare. So they, in fact, when they, when, when, you know, when we come back to school, one of the things I strongly suggest, I'm here when I come back to school because it's vacation, 
but if it, I hope not, if it ever happens uh, any other time, is one person and only one person reads them. It could be the Nile, it could be the psychologist, it could be, you know, the guidance counselor tells them, and, you know, we're aware that something very big happened. If you ever need to talk, you know, come see me, I'll be happy to, but otherwise treat them normally. They want to be, in fact, when I visit, I pay a ship visit to a child, and I tell the child, you know, I'm going to your school tomorrow. Is there anything you want to tell your classmates? I can almost predict, yeah, treat me normally. And I tell the kids that if he's your friend, continue to be your friend. And by the way, very important, this goes for adults as well as children, because you feel bad for them, don't feign more friendship than you have. People who are suffering, it's very interesting. We think people who are suffering become dumb. It's just the opposite. They have, a, it's, they, they may be oblivious to things, but regarding their pain, they're brilliant. They're very astute. And they know what's real and what's fake. And if you're going to feign more friendship because you feel bad for them, that's pity. They're going to hate. In fact, one of my classic stories was I, I went down to Mexico City after um, Maiza Saba was killed in the helicopter crash. I'll tell you one aside, just uh, it's one of my favorite stories. But um, you know, if you think Israelis drive crazy, um, any of you been to Mexico? You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> Mexicans drive, and I'm guys driving me around. He's weaving in and out of traffic, ignoring all traffic signals. And, you know, and talking with both hands while he's driving, you know, and I'm thinking, gee, you know, I, my, my family's going to need the services of my department services. And he saw I was nervous, so he very delicately said to me, you know, here in Mexico, we consider a red light a suggestion. So not where I come from, you know. <laughs> but anyway, but um, they had this, the, the Sabas had uh, Benzikun and a young child, like a fourth grader, I think. And I met with the teachers from the school. And actually, I was surprised because they were Spanish speaking that they knew this word. But one of his teachers told me, you know, he has a nemesis. He has an enemy, a kid who always fights with him. So we're going to tell him to be nice to him. I said, don't you dare. He's going to come to school. And this kid's always starting with this. Something going to be nice. And he's going to know that's only petty. You tell the kid as soon as he comes in, punch him in the nose and start the fight all over again. That's what they want. They want to be treated. No, they don't want that disproportionate focus. So the same thing's true for the rest of no oh, puppy, I know you poor thing, or you know, treat it normally. Treat it. Now, one of the things that comes up, and we spoke about this the other night when, uh, when I spoke to some of the friends, um, the concept of surrogacy. In fact, I told the story when I met with the friends last night. Um, it's a great uh, story. You know, when I, I was involved with a woman who had a very ter terrible marriage, abusive, and everything. We finally got the guy out of the house, and she had two sons, I think they were like 11 and 13 or something like that. She went to the first shop this morning. She lived in the far way. They got to the shop this morning. She's, she's going to take the shoe. And she's standing with him. And suddenly there's a knock on the door. And there's Robbie Bender. Come, boys, let's go. Let's go to shoe. And so she ultimately remembered. He took the shoe every shop. When there's an absence of a father, there's a need to fill the void. Somebody's got to throw, you know, play ball with him. Somebody, I remember I mentioned the other night, one woman who, who got divorced. And she, you know, had a son, like fifth grade, like sixth grade, whatever. And you know, needed help with his Gemara homework. So she bought an art scroll. Figured what's going to be so difficult, right? Try to make sense out of an art scroll when you've never learned Gemara. You know, just staring at it, you know, like, doesn't know what to do. So maybe somebody has to help him cause a Gemara for a test. Maybe somebody has to dance with him on their shoulders on the on some story. So there's some room for special friends to fill that void. And the research shows that when there is an absent parent, for whatever reason the parent is absent, whether it's death, divorce, mental illness, whatever it might be, when other people fill the void, the child does better. But it should be, there's two caveats. First of all, only with Mrs. Lundenberg's consent. Do not take away from her, her parental role. She's the parent. She's gonna to rise to the occasion. Um, and, and uh, you know, again, it's this, the dignity, the self-respect. So you ask her first before you do anything. Second of all, it shouldn't be just one person. It should be a, a team. Because if it's one person, and let's say that person now gets this great job in Los Angeles and leaves, that's another loss. It should be a cluster, a collection of people that sort of fill that void. One more thing that's important that kind of segues very neatly into adolescence. And that's again, I, I'm giving you really the Reader's Digest version. Um, elementary school age children are not trying to figure out a show. They're not struggling with Sadiq Rabba Rosh We are, I remember once, uh, again, there was a, a sudden death of a kid on a Shabbos, and then we had a blizzard on Sunday. Again, let me explain what a blizzard is when there's like this ton of snow. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> you have them down here. Okay. You're often there anyway, right? You know, you come to Rochester, you don't have blizzards. I don't know what sunshine is. But, um, and so, so, so there was no school on Sunday. I didn't get there till Monday. I walk into this like fourth grade class in yeshiva, and the boys are raising this. My father told me that he was a Gilgal from a previous neshama. Uh, my father told me that he was only meant to live that long, and that was, uh, they had no idea what they were talking about. The parents were struggling with this. Um, uh, kids that age, you know, they know God is powerful. They know God do what He says, and that's that's about trying to figure Hashem out. They they take very kindly the concepts of uh, the neshama, there's a mason and and Olam Haba. It's good to talk to them about that, not too much, but it is helpful. When you get that of lessons, it's a whole different world. That's the age where they're going to struggle with Tazir Rosh Hashanah. That's the age when they're thinking in concepts, when, when they're, 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 and they're thinking in, you know, in, in trying to understand Hashem, not just follow Hashem. And, it's, it, and also an age sometimes where I can be a little more innovative and different. I'm not talking about full fledged rebellion like drugs, like that, but it's a good, it's a healthy thing during adolescence. I'm sure you know, as when the Hall teaches in a high school, uh, you know, try to do your own thing, to be a little different. So they will bring that up. That's the age, and of course, well, custom, but the benefit also is when Hashem works out everything beautifully, this is also the age where they, they can tolerate that there's no answer to questions. It was a uh, take of, you know, that we don't know that. Hashem, Moshe Rabbeinu asked that question to Hashem, and he, he couldn't answer him. So they may struggle with it, but we can, if they're, if they're bringing it up to, to be rebellious, and my favorite line for that, whenever I have that, I'll say, wow, that's a great question. You want to stay in during recess and we can discuss it? You'll never see them again. Okay, that's the question again. Because yeah. they want an audience. But if it's really, they're really struggling with it, like in schools where that has happened, where they really struggle with the appearance of injustice, of, of how long it seems, that's the age. And that's the age when you can say, you know, uh, I like to quote sometimes the Kotzka Rebbe who said, I can never believe in, in a God I could understand. But Hashem, by definition, has to be mysterious. These kind of concepts uh, the teenager can understand. Um, I'm going to, okay, I, again, I think I mentioned this before, but I want to say it one more time and then conclude with the story. Don't drown this, particularly this one. Don't overdo it. She again, yeah, deserve a sense of of of, um, of dignity. I, I I often like to quote, and maybe I'm reflecting my YU Torah Mada education. But I like to quote Shakespeare when it comes to this. And the Shakespeare is the story of Othello. If uh, you remember, I'm sure you all remember Othello. I think I got a real education, but um, you know, but Othello was a play about a, a Moor, very powerful Moorish general, who nearly conquered the world. And of course, he marries uh, Desdemona, and she does him with no army could. She destroys him. And at the end, in typical Shakespeare, he lands up, he's totally defeated and everything because she betrayed him. And he kills her, and he's about to kill himself. And before he thrusts the knife in his chest, he says, Remember the Moor who loved not wisely, but too well. This is such an important one. Remember the Moor who loved, remember he, I'm sorry, remember he who loved not wisely, but too well. This applies to the Lindbergh, this applies to our children, this applies to our spouses, our parents. Our job is to love wisely, give what they need, not too much, not too little. Your hearts are broken, you feel so bad for them, you may want to, you know, just overdo it, take over everything. Again, preserve their very competent family, show your concern, show your love, share it with them, and, and you know, I'll conclude with one of my favorite studies, and I think it's important and speaks to why we're here tonight. I have to tell you that during COVID, I think I quoted that study every day. And the study was the Steep Hill study. I don't know how many of you know that study, but what they did was they took college freshmen. I always say we love studying college freshmen for 10 bucks to do anything. And took them to a very steep hill. And they gave them a very heavy backpack. And they said, we want you to climb this hill. But before you climb the hill, estimate, give me a sense of how hard you think it is. The only difference was one group climbed the hill alone and the other one climbed the hill with a friend. And pretty much say that the ones who climbed the hill with a friend estimated the hill as less difficult than climbing it alone. What you're gonna do as a community, 
And what you're going to do for the little birds is you're going to let them, you're not going to let them climb the toe of a lot. You're going to climb it with them by showing your concern, by preserving this memory, by sharing stories, memories that you have. Not now when it's on every point, two years from now, three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. It's so important. You're going to do it by giving to them, but not over giving. But mostly showing them how much you love them and how much you love that. And that's the common. It's still a hill, it's still a tough climb, but they're not climbing it alone, they're climbing with you. And I have to tell you that the Boca community, I, I know I get a lot of advertisements from Rafa, who relocated from uh, our neck of the woods to, to the Boca, but she's right, I've been here many times. This is a very special, cohesive, beautiful community. And you're going to make the hill less of an ordinary task for them. Than it would be would be otherwise. Um, I think that's pretty much what I think I'm covering like a lot of points. So let me open up if there's questions, comments, bubbles. If it's time for you to go back to New York, um, you know. How do you help people avoid how coming across this pity? How do you the avoid about coming across this pity? So again, a lot of it has to do with how you do it. So if you come to that, you know, I know it's so it's so hard for you, you know. You know yeah, you know, some doesn't know how to you know, play ball, you know. Oh, you say that. Listen, I'm taking my kid to the park. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna have a little like baseball game, right? You? you like to come along? Or you know what? Uh, my son has you know, my son struggling with the Gamara test. Maybe the two boys would like to sit down together and we'll go over it together and prepare for the test. You know, um you wanna come over and say, you know, listen, I know Donnie used to was so handy and fix things in the house. Uh, we were very similar that way. If you ever need something, yeah, be cool. Happy to come over and, uh, and do something like, you know, help out with that. Something, but say like, you know, and 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 if you see and you read, you know, so it doesn't want that, that's intrusive. Uh, it's like, drop it. Don't keep asking. You know, read, read her response. But it's the tone and the manner in which you do it. It's it's not, you know, necessarily what you say. It's how you, very how you do it. You're going to a, you know, uh, going to the uh, to a ball game, a or something. Come on, but in a matter matter of, matter of fact way, uh, saying no, he doesn't want to feel pity either. For sure, that's for sure he doesn't want. To. Very interesting. I, I once spoke to someone who lost their father when they were six years old. They're now a contemporary of mine, a friend of mine. And now, at this at our age, it's nothing out of the ordinary that you have a yard site. Uh, so you know, we're both in our sixties. And um, he he, um, but he told me that whatever it's his father's yard site, and he takes the Ahmed, He always thinks everybody should be staring at him, saying, "What's that little kid doing down there in front of him?" It's so in him that perception, that experience. That he, he still feels it like today, like today. That, that speaks to how powerful that is. Kids, and I, I know, for example, I don't know what the arrangement was. Actually, somebody spoke to me about it, about the arrangement of the cottage. Um, and if a kid, I don't have to tell you, if you go to Shul, you got like my age, you're saying cottage, you go on top of the stock market. But you hear that pip squeak voice of a little kid, everybody's staring and looking. So the kids don't want to say cottage, or it's very important for them to say cottage. So sometimes what I suggest is, Either uh, if the kids end very often in school, there's only one child saying Kaddish. So either they dab in, in a shul before that for him, instead of uh, you know dabbing with the rest of it, you know, with, with, with the kids and say Kaddish there. Or if there's a Rebbe who's in a, you know, has who can say Kaddish, who has already, you know, most parents. So he says Kaddish with the child. So it's not just that little kid making that Kaddish and saying it, just saying it together. But uh, the kids very often resist the Kaddish. They just don't want that age, they don't want that spotlight on them. Yes, Rabbi. I know he moves a little bit within the next day, but the distinction between grief and pain. The, the grief is something that is always there, but you learn to. Uh, you know, but there, are, but there are people who somehow feel that they can't let go of the pain, that they have to. Ah. The pain. And ah. Is there any way to help them? That's a brilliant question. But the question that the, the, our culture asked is that the people don't want to let go of the pain. And it's it's true and it's legitimate. 
So it depends what you talk about. Sometimes, you know, people want to go to pain because the pain represents the kinship with the person. It represents the kinship, the connection with the person. And when it gets less painful, they feel guilty. They feel like they're, they're abandoning the person. Sometimes, um, some, you know, there are four instances where therapy is effective. Um, and one of them is if the person has a pre existing mental illness. So sometimes what happens or has a pre existing mental illness. So if somebody had either depression or, or a, a predisposition to depression and then suffers a loss, then that can bring out a depression. And then therapy helps you treat the depression. Sometimes the people who cling to pain afterwards are, are doing so because it, it, it kicked off the depression. Sometimes it's, they just don't like it. But usually the people who want to let go feel guilty about the pain go away, you know, come to terms with it. Really, that that's, that's the way life works. You know, that's what Hashem made us. And they, they accept it. Um, but if somebody's really clinging to the pain, <clears throat> I would suspect a pre existing condition. Sometimes, and I, you know, uh, that probably depends on how the planet is at some point. Sometimes the trauma, but it's a highly traumatic event. It's a violent death or something like that. Sometimes the trauma makes it very hard to treat this. Right? So there are situations where that's a meal. Yeah. Many, most do go through the grieving process. And, uh, you know, uh, eventually, as I said, grieve forever, but it just doesn't hurt as much. And, and that's the norm. And you should know it. I think it's important to know. Resilience and health is the norm. Without breathing specialists, Shem put the hum in the world. This is going to be the hum. Right, whatever. Classic scene I have very old. A young parent dies. The mother calls me. She wants to make an appointment for the 13 year old son. She comes. You can tell she hasn't slept in weeks. She was in this room. The kid is standing as far as away as he can in my waiting room with his hands crossed and his body language basically saying, I'd rather have a, a root canal with anesthesia than talk to you. But the kid doesn't want to be, you know, you're telling now, first thing, so now you're telling me he's crazy. So, you know, so don't push therapy. Offer it for them. Um, you could always give it, by the way, for, for my, for, 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 for my request, my number, agreement. certainly we could become friends, unfortunately, for the last few weeks. Um, if they has my number, anybody who has any issue or any concern, you call me. Any time of the day, any time of the night, that's the nature of my work. So please, you know, it's not, you don't have to ask me first if you feel this legitimate concern. You can just give the people my number and, and call me. Um, or, or call Rafa, if you want local assistance. Um, but uh, don't push therapy if they don't want to push it. But push it on the Yes, go ahead. There's one big thing. You mentioned about the young children, they're not asking about the exact or how do you mention the past? It seems from experience that the case here you know, the youngest child is fifth grade age, and fifth graders are talking about the girls and the boys, they are asking. I realize, okay. You know, it's interesting you say so sorry, very much it's a hard asking that question. So you know, there's a, I like to quote the, the great New York philosopher and theologian Yogi Berra, who, who would say, you know, the old Yankee Stadium, um, that around three o'clock afternoon would be a shadow that would descend upon the stadium. And he used to say it's getting late very early on. Um, children are growing up quicker. So Ken Zine, fifth graders are already starting to have an adolescent brain. So, you know, so it's so kids are changing, and so maybe already at that point, but fifth grade, I'd be very surprised if the third grade was next to the grade. But I know, you know, who knows? They're, they're, they're growing up. I have to constantly sort of update my developmental piece because kids, not only because of, the, of their rapid development, but because of what the internet is nowadays. They're becoming so savvy. That um, you know, I have the you know, good example. Um, for many, many years, I thought that the child was the parent. I would, you know, I thought it was very important that the child go to the funeral and even go to the burial. But I also say, you know, that he doesn't have to see the internment. It's so scary. So I'll stand in the back a little bit. I'll have a memory that he was there. He's a little kid. They're big people. He won't see it. So you know, he doesn't have to. I'm now in recent years a parent of, of eight year olds and nine year olds. So I. Going right there, picking up a shovel and digging. Kids, they're, they're growing up very fast. They're exposed to everything. 
and they're not used and they want to be part of everything. They feel they're entitled to be a part of everything. So that's now a whole new, whole new ballgame. So kids change it. You know? So that I would be my guess that maybe maybe I have to like let it get late very early and move it, move it up a bit, uh, my, my cutoff age. Yeah, yeah anything else? Uh, yeah, please. Um. I'm looking only because I don't hear some other stuff. Okay, I'll talk about it. We're saying that we should treat them normal, treat the family normally, and not add more pity than right. Um, it would usually, but like let's say they're they're not feeling normal. Let's say an Arab Shabbat should we send an extra text, an extra text, or extra sure. call before a hard day? I don't sure. want them to come across as pity. Sure, I didn't say to ignore them. I, so let's 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 talk, try two different texts. One text is I hope Shabbos is restful and replenishing, and stop by if you'd like to. I'd love to see you, or maybe I'll stop by in the afternoon if that's okay. Or I can just imagine how the bar the Shabbos must be for you, and and who's going to say Kada? Who's going to say Kiddush? You know, it must be tar. You know, yeah. But no, please. You know, even if that's not something you would usually do. Yeah, right. No, I'm not saying they do need special they administration. Need no, I'm sorry. I'm, 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 I don't mean just like make believe nothing happened. But do it, like I said, do it with dignity. Now, again, it also depends how you, what the nature of your friendship is. You know, if if you never visited them, they never invited you, now you start showing up every every week, they're going to resent it. It's like, well, what are you doing? That's that's pity. If you really are a good friend, then it'd be very natural for you to get together. Yeah, so you'll come every shot. And 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 the people welcome that. And people feel very and and, and again, I I know here in this community we've talked to people who have had losses and they feel very cared for and loved and attended to. And that's that's you know it's yeah, I remember that that same aunt and uncle that uncle died. Um I was waiting for my aunt outside after the, the funeral and she came out, it was raining, she had an umbrella and she was surrounded by 10, 15 grandchildren, which was pretty incredible. She only has eight grandchildren, but no. <laughs> now she was surrounded by her kids and her grandchildren. And she saw me and she knows I do this work. And, and she said, you see, Norman, I'm cocooned. That's what we do, we cocoon them. We make them feel loved, make them feel cared for. But I'm just saying, but not the pit. You know, and, uh, and don't connote that she won't be able to, uh, you know, my, 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 my cousin, Shemi Beagleizen, Shemi Komdemo, was one of the victims in Noyalin. And his almana told me, you know, he, he paid the bills. That was his job in the house. So almana told me that uh, whenever she got a bill after, you know, she would take it, she had a shopping bag, she'd throw the shopping bag, she didn't know what she paid a bill in her life. So, no, already a few weeks, and she's getting, or a few months, she's getting these threatening letters, you know? So she figured she got to do something about it, and she had a whole shopping bag full of bills. So she took a huge picture of Shemi, she put it on the dining room table. She took the chop bag, she emptied it, and she looked at the picture and said, Shimmy, you got me in this mess, and now you're getting me out. And she figured out how to pay bills. You know, uh, people rise to the occasion. Strength and resilience is not. But please don't ignore it. No, I don't mean to say that. Just do it with dignity and with care and with love. You know, with, with, with genuine, especially if you're the close friends. Just develop her. Or the kids, or the kids don't want to be involved. No, no, they don't want to be involved. <laughs> Although the old, or, you know, the, the, the high school boys may very much gravitate towards the bay and may feel open to open to the Rebbe. It's, it's a beautiful aspect of our world that we have that special Rebbe Thomas relationship. And that can be very therapeutic for them. Um, and it's something that, again, if they're receptive to it, should be nurtured. Yeah, I think the comment that you've made about normal is really more for school age children. Than yes. Than. Yes. Yeah, so they they want to be normal. Want to be totally fascinating. Normal, but the 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 other the other age they oh, yeah. want to be pity, but they want the love. Yeah. When you're a teenager, it's okay to be different. You know, you can have green hair. You know, it's it's you know it's it's tolerated. Um, with at, at elementary school age, they want to be all together. They want to be the same. They want to root for the same ball team. They want to you know. They, they want everything more together. So fascinating, just to give an example. One of the things that we've seen sometimes is what I call the eruption. What happens? Uh, again, let's say a fourth grader, right? Is what's the parent? Comes back to school, picks up like, like nothing happened, you know, playing ball, laughing, pulling pranks, you know, doing everything, you know. And one day there's a, a relatively boring place. You don't have that down here in Brooklyn. Here it could be occasionally some boring places, you know. 
Maybe we'll play Aspen, you know, the kids are daydreaming or something like current events, you know, or something like that. And suddenly he bursts into tears. Why does that happen? Because he's been suppressing the grief, be normal. And then he starts thinking about his father and he sort of loses sight that he's been and he starts crying. And that, that's, and that, we have a way of handling that. I'm not going to go through you know, I, I, I warn teachers about, about that, but um, that's because again, because they're suppressing the grief at that age, because they want to appear normal. So just if you have children that are friends with the fifth grader, they're what sure. should you, what should you Okay, the if they're very good friends, um, they can say something, how are you doing, I feel bad, and they can share memories of the father, fun memories. He was so funny. I remember how he dressed up in Purim. Yeah, they can be done something like that. You can do that. They're not such close friends, but just interacting as they had before. Um, that also you have to tell your kids because kids don't know what they They're going to be fine. They're not going to fall apart. They're going to affect it, not damaged. But don't think, don't be scared. Don't treat them like porcelain. You know, they'll, they'll be okay. You know, it's very sad and they'll be sad and they're going to miss their father, but they're not going to, you know, transform into some weirdo. And that's important to tell them also. And, and by the way, another thing sometimes you hear from the kids. So can I talk about my father? Now, you know, I don't know if I would, you know, give a two hour speech about how wonderful my father is. But uh, they know they don't have a father now. They, you know, and then, I mean, he's not here. They have a father. But he's not here. And you're not going to, you might, you know, you don't have to, I sometimes tell the kids they like it, they laugh, but they don't have to fight. You know, lock your father in a closet when he comes over. You know, uh, that's that, that's the world. You know, they're 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 in that world. You know, the issues that come up with like Father's Day or uh, you know Father Son Learning programs. So many schools now, not only the through the death, but the divorce, or some fathers are just not going. So they're shifting to you know saying we door the door or something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, by the way, this is a lot of what we're doing when we talk about um, shifting back to our own mission, the trauma sensitive schools. Is we're 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 working more and more to sensitize. Help sensitize teachers, even secretaries, security guards, to the vulnerabilities of children, so they can be appropriately responsive to it, to it, to those vulnerabilities. So that's these are issues that come up. So I, you don't exaggerate, but you know, it's it's the reality. What do you mean by they have a father who's not here? I, I didn't hear him. Here. Sorry. What do you mean by they have a father who's not here? Oh, and what father is in, is in your mind? That's an issue. Yeah. Yeah, well, in fact, if, if then at some point Mrs. Lindbergh decides to get remarried, nobody's replacing her. You know, I mean, it's not a topic now, but when those things happen, very important that they know, the children know that this is a stepfather, not your father, you have one father. He's always going to be your father. That's, that's very important. And he's watching you from Shammai and he's proud of you. You know, always put right, right, the right, Walter, right. The boys have one father. They have a wonderful stepfather, but they have one father. You know, um, it's and, and, that, and that's very important. Anything, anything else? Okay. Um, hope this was helpful. Um, and as I said, uh, I'm gonna say we are available. We could have a bracha and the team that we're developing here, but uh, also myself, you know, anytime if you need to speak, something comes up or whatever, any concerns you have, you about the women doing what's in your own family, something like that, related to trauma and, and all that, because uh, the only thing I know. Um, then, you know, please feel free to get in touch. You don't have to, you know, to ask me first, just say, no, I can, or I can find it. I'll share one thing I was once presenting. We, we do this training in Parmasora, and once there's some woman on the Zoom stream, and after I present it, she says to me, Dr. Wormsall, I have about a hundred questions for you. Can I have your email address? And I said, sure, dpelkovitz at gmail.com. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, you want to reach me, it's dpelkovitz at gmail.com. Okay, thank you. This is my host. Okay. Send my love. I will. Okay. Okay. Great to see you. Great to see you.